I'm here because I am an educator and I am fascinated by the way in which we can use children's questions as a gateway to deep learning. So I get to spend, and now you're really wondering, what do I spend a lot of time in? One of these. <laughs> When my kids were little, I would notice the way that a car ride would put them in this strange kind of a trance. Uh, if they weren't crying or asleep or storing food away in the crevices of the back seat for the long, cold winter ahead, there would be this delicious kind of silence, this weighty silence, the silence of the imminent, and sure enough, it would come. Mummy? Um, I was just wondering, now whether it was the swish of the windscreen wipers or the passing landscape or the hum of the engine or the fact that we couldn't actually look each other in the eye, there was something about a car ride that would inevitably give rise to a question as they gazed out. I came to really cherish those ums. They signalled a moment of pause in our busy lives, a place marker between one activity and the next. Sometimes a car ride was the chance for us to pick up loose threads of events that had happened weeks beforehand. They were a time for reflection, for pausing, to let big ideas come in, or sometimes to open our minds simply to allow the most random of observations. Mum, why do dogs have faces? I took to keeping post-it notes in the car so that I could scribble down some of my favourite questions at the traffic lights. Let me share some with you. So, did God want all this stuff here? These houses, this road? Um, Liam and Jack were my friends in grade two. How come they just run away when they see me now? Why do people smoke when they know it can kill them? So, um, does everyone see the same thing when they look at that? I mean, when you see red, do you see what I see when I see red? Why can't I marry my sister? Um, will you die one day? Will I die? Ionesco famously said that it's not the answer that enlightens, it's the question. And I couldn't agree more. A question can be such a thing of beauty. It leaves us open, vulnerable, and on the precipice of learning something new but something that we have invited in. The wonder bubble that is my car has kind of transformed into more of a confessional now that my children are teenagers, but it's never lost that beautiful atmosphere of reflection. Elaine de Baton describes, in fact, journeys as the midwives of thought, and for us, many of our journeys have been just that. They've given birth to some of the best questions, to some of our best thinking, and some of our most precious silences. So, I'm a parent, but as I said, I'm also an educator, and for much of my professional life, I've been fortunate to work with children and teachers all over the world. So, when I'm not in one of these, or one of these, you can usually find me in one of these, the classroom. Now, the classroom, in many ways, is the antithesis of that wonder bubble that I've described as my car on a long journey, or a treehouse, or the front porch, or the bath, or anywhere where we are still enough to be reflective and to allow those big thoughts and speculations to occur in our minds. Classrooms are busy, often noisy, or strangely too quiet places. And whether they are the kind of sterile environment that I grew up in, 
or the colourful, chock full of dingle dangle classrooms that I created when I first started teaching, regardless of the style, they can still be rather alienating or disconnecting places for children. I think classrooms can be very poor habitats for wonder. It can be very difficult to find night, maybe, could be. Um, I wonder, let's see, tell me more. In an environment that is often dominated by is, isn't, must, should, yes, no, quick, right, wrong. Classrooms tend to favour the quick and the decisive, while um hovers somewhat nervously at the door. What if more classrooms were habitats in which wonder thrived? What if classrooms were places that children knew their questions would be heard? What if it was more exciting in a classroom to not know something than it was to know something? I mean, we know that children don't stop having questions just because they come to school. But maybe we stop giving ourselves the opportunity to listen to them. Pluto is very tiny and nobody's ever discovered about it. I wonder why rabbits have eyes on the side of their head. How do ants make kids? Um, I wonder about who discovered England. How many bones you can collect in one dinosaur's body? Because like, if like is I think it's one of the, like the first countries ever discovered. So I'd like to find out who discovered it and what their name was. Was it like a Chinese name or an Indian name or a real English name? Sometimes I wonder if Jesus was real or not. So sometimes I wonder about how Aboriginals first got onto Australia. Yeah, where do weeds come from? When turtles are on their backs, why do they die? Sometimes I wonder when... when the, the engagement um, got started. If humans were around when dinosaurs were around. The engagement. It's when you get married. Sometimes I wonder how do people get in, um, invited to things. Don't know if I want to get married or not. The children that you have just met are from a local school in Melbourne, where I live, that I've been fortunate to work with for many years, and their questions are delightful. But in many ways, they're not unique. As I said, I work with children around the world, and I collect questions from them, like some people collect souvenir spoons or pens from hotel rooms. The interesting thing is, that when you survey the rich territory that is children's questions, what you notice is that they reflect the big questions that we all grapple with our whole lives. Who am I? How did I get here? What makes me, me? What makes me work? And how am I the same as and different to you? And how can I connect to you? And what about everything else? How did it get here? And how does it work? And why do things go wrong? And what can we do when they do go wrong? How can we make things better? Children's questions can lead us and them to those big concepts, those big ideas that are really worth making meaning about. The great writer John Steinbeck wrote a beautiful poem in tribute to his favourite teacher, the teacher that had had the biggest impact on him as a child. 
And in that poem, he described the classroom as a place where the children's speculations ranged the world. He says that they came to that classroom door each day with their ideas cupped in their hands like captured fireflies. Isn't that a beautiful image? The image of the firefly representing the glow of wonder, representing the burning passion, the fire within. I think more classrooms should be places like the one that Steinbeck experienced all those years ago, places where we invite wonder in, places where children's questions can lead us to those big ideas, the ideas, the places we want to take them to anyway. In rethinking education, sometimes we need to consider rethinking as simply thinking again, going back, going back to remind ourselves of our core business. Surely, surely classrooms should be places where children are engaged in inquiring into the way their world works, both external and internal. Ken Robinson has accused schools of being places that kill creativity. And sometimes I worry that if we're not very, very careful, curiosity may well be the next victim. But then, then I'm reassured. I'm reassured by the growing number of classrooms that I visit around the world where teachers have committed themselves to working with children in a spirit of inquiry. These are teachers who take children's questions and celebrate them. Teachers who invite wonder in. They don't just invite it in, they actively nurture it, they provoke it. They know how to use questions in order to take kids on journeys of discovery to the concepts, the understandings that the teachers themselves and sometimes the curriculum has determined. Inquiry teachers don't just teach kids things that will be soon forgotten. They instill within them a passion and a hunger for learning. Annette is one such teacher. She teaches five-year-olds in a school just down the road from my house. I can almost see her classroom if I stand on my tippy toes and look out the front door. Not long ago, when Annette and her children walked into the classroom towards the end of the day, they found in the room, on the mat waiting for them, a most unexpected visitor. Now, for some teachers, the excitement that then ensued would have been an annoying distraction at the end of the day. They had things to do and get on with. But for Annette, an inquiry teacher, the praying mantis was a welcome provocation. She's an inquiry teacher, so what does she ask? She asks, what are you wondering? And the questions fly thick and fast. What is it? How did it get here? Why is it green? Is it a spider? No, it's, it's a praying mantis. Does it pray? What does it eat? Can we keep it? Why does it have long legs? So many questions. And it promised the children that tomorrow morning, when they came into school, they would be researchers. She says, let's see what we can find out. We've got so many questions. You can even start finding out tonight. Your researchers, you know what to do when you don't know. The next morning, the children arrived at school, excited, ready to explore. But unfortunately, the praying mantis, that I promise you, had been given everything a praying mantis could possibly need to survive the night, <laughs> had succumbed and was no longer with us. The praying mantis had died. But the inquiry had not. For Annette, it was just a new pathway. The children had more questions. So what should we do? Why did it die? Should we have a funeral? What's a funeral? What happens in funerals? Annette had intended 
to explore the concept of life cycles with her children that year. This was the perfect opportunity. One of the questions was, so is he in the circle of life now, like the Lion King? <laughs> she hadn't quite intended to explore the rituals associated with funerals, but you know what? She did. There were some children in that class that had been to funerals. The others were fascinated, and together they developed a ritual for that praying mantis. I can promise you two things. That that insect had the best send-off <laughs> of any invertebrate ever to have roamed the earth, and also that those children would never forget that moment. Annette, like the other inquiry teachers I work with, knows that her job is not to fill the children's heads with soon forgotten things, but rather to instill in them a hunger, a passion, to nurture that curiosity they were born with, to listen to their questions, to ensure that they are comfortable with uncertainty. Um, 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 I think I forgot. Well, I've always wondered how the universe has been created. I wonder how the world starts. I've always wondered, um, like, how is the world made and what made it or who made it? And, um, like, how did the features, like trees and stuff, how were they made? I believe Earth was actually created when um, lots and lots of boulders got together. And when they did, it caused friction. And that's why Earth was so hot and it was a volcanic planet until lots of chemicals started coming in. Maybe the people jumped from the moon to the um, Earth. And I've also wondered things like um, how were animals made and how have they come alive. And... I also wonder why people kill animals and plants for no reason if we need them to help us live and survive. I've always been wondering how does our brain work inside of us and like what parts are in it. And... Why do people be actresses? How do they like become one? I think there's lots of big parts and small parts in it and maybe medium-sized parts as well. Why the world doesn't use one language so we can all communicate together. We're humans, I've always wondered a lot of things about us. I wonder, I wonder how, um, I'm one, I've been wondering We're humans. I've always wondered a lot about us. Isn't that beautiful? So, what are you 